SJC 11358, Commonwealth versus Leon Gelfgat. All right, yes. May it please the court, Randall Ravitz for the Commonwealth. Compelling the defendant to decrypt his computers according to the Commonwealth's protocol and where the Commonwealth already knows anything that he would be implicitly communicating in doing so would not offend his rights against self-incrimination. One can think of three categories of statements. First are those where the defendant directly tells something to the government. Those would implicate the privilege, but they wouldn't be compelled here. Second are those contained in materials prepared previously and voluntarily. Those are likely implicated here, but compelling their production doesn't offend the privilege. Do you already have knowledge of spe any specific information that's on the computers? We, we have knowledge that there are files on the computers, which factually distinguishes this case from the 11th Circuit case. We have knowledge that uh, the defendant used his computers in the course of mortgage-related activity. Uh, we have knowledge that there's decryption software on there and that he can decrypt. As far as the, the specific contents of files, we don't, we don't have knowledge of that. And, and do you have knowledge which computers were used? We, uh, the investigator saw him um, in particular using a laptop in the course of activity that they could tell from other evidence was uh, related to mortgage-related activity. Um, and then there's- the Illegal mortgage-related activity? That, uh, we allege, yes, yes. But, but the only one that he, well, it's a little ambiguous, but one way of reading what he said was that, um, that his decrypting capacity related to one computer, isn't that so? Uh, we, we say otherwise uh, because the, first we say that this was, this was a lengthy interview. It's 86 pages in our, in our uh, appendix, and really all of his statements should be taken together. But as far as his ability to decrypt in particular, uh, he said, uh, I can encrypt my computer, and encryption is part of my life, but he also said that you're not going to get to any of my computers. And, my, and, and uh, he talked about having two desktops and a laptop, um, and in other places referred to uh, multiple computers. Um, so when he talked about his software, he said it doesn't matter whether it's on the laptop or on any other device. So looking at the comments as a whole, we say it wouldn't be a fair reading of the transcript to say that he was really just talking about one computer. But isn't that precisely your problem? I mean. Uh if he, if, you, if, you do, if he does what you ask him to do, he will effectively be admitting that he has custody and control over particular computers and that you can authenticate those documents by saying that they were his. Uh, and in the Hubble case, the Hubble case takes away the manna from heaven theme uh, and says, if you, give him, if you give him use immunity for the production, that immunizes not only the documents themselves, not only, not only, but it also immunizes any, anything that may derive from those documents. Uh, so it seems the Hubble case clobbers you. How do you get past the Hubble case? Well, we, we agree with the reading of Hubble, but critically here, anything that he would be communicating implicitly by showing us he can decrypt, he's already communicated explicitly or, or implicitly by telling us he so can decrypt. So only if we read the um, transcript the way you say it needs to be read. That for the, for the foregone conclusion rule to apply, yes, you, you would have to accept our reading of the transcript. Well, there is, however, uh, another exception. And, 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 and if there is any ambiguity in that, which I thought you had conceded earlier, don't you lose? No, uh, I, I, forgive me, I did not can see that there's ambiguity. Are you say it's perfectly clear which computers he has a custody and control over. Yes, we, we say that the which ones. These were all in his house. These were all in his house. Um, they were so there. There was <clears throat> evidence in addition to the fact uh, of his statement. So, for example, um, one of the computers was powered on, and it said on there uh, Leon's documents or something to that effect. Um, it it. Um, they, they were found in his house. Uh, there was evidence of his use of computers. He identified the computers that were seized by the government as being, as being his. He said, you, you probably have the computers that I have in my house. 
Um, so then if... It's not the same thing as saying that they're his. Does he live in that house alone? He, he does not. Uh, th there are other people in the house, he says, but he, he talked about the computers as being his. You said the computers in his house. You didn't say his computers. You, well, there, there are other statements uh, that we rely on. So, for example, um, you have a computer at home, a desktop? Yeah, more than one. Uh, you're not going to get to any of my computers. Um, my computer is encrypted. I can encrypt my computer. Um, Singular. Singular. Well, but, but if he's talking about having several computers and then the interviewers follow up and ask him questions about encryption, and, and in the course of doing that, he says, yes, I can unencrypt my computer, it's, it's a little too much to say that, well, he really he was only referring to one particular computer. Other computers in his house that were encrypted, he himself is unable to decrypt. Can, can are, are all the computers encrypted, and were they all found in the same room? No. The, um, there were two desktops, uh, a laptop, and a netbook. Um, the desktops and the laptop were found in the home, and the netbook was found in his car. Um, but if this were, were they all in the same room in the house? Um, that that I don't know. It's not in the in the record. Um, but if yes, th this court would have to, in order for the for foregone conclusion rule to apply, this court would have to um, accept our view of 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 the extent of the government's knowledge. But if this court were to say that there's more that can be read into his act of decryption than we say can be read into his act of decryption, then it also needs to be read into any statements that he made uh, previously. Can, can, I, can I ask you this? Um, what is your, I mean, it's a somewhat different point, but it seems that the judge is saying, that's all very nice, but really what you are asking him to do by decrypting is um, to uh, explain information that is indecipherable right now. Um, uh, basically, I mean, I, I think he maybe he analogized it to like a map that's in code, and and you're asking him to give you the code to read the map, right? W what's what's wrong with that view of it? And if that is the view, why can you do that without violating the Fifth Amendment in Article Twelve? Well. The Superior Court seemed to, as Your Honor said, analogize this to him explaining what's on his computers to us. But that is critically different for purposes of this area of law because that would involve imparting the knowledge that he has from his mind to the government. And that we're not asking him to do. So this here is more, uh, is more analogous to- Well, at the moment, it's all scrambled, right? Correct. So you want him to descramble it for you? We want him to, yes, and, to, and that is a form of conduct. It's a form of conduct just like, for example, uh, preparing uh, a handwriting analysis. Um, this court has said about things like, a uh, handwriting exemplar, excuse me. This court has said about things like that, that they require forms of participation, uh, it said in Brennan, but yet they can be compelled. So, the, so, 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 so. I mean, the example that comes to my mind is, you know, in the days before computers, I would have all my files in my home and uh, office and, and um, in cabinets and wherever. And if I had been clever enough, I could have kept it all in coded language. And it would have been completely scrambled if um, the government got a warrant um, and came in and, and seized all those things. Um, can the government then say, well, we don't want you to tell you us what the code is, but just descramble it all for us and put that back into a language that is, and that's just conduct. I'm not asking what's in your mind. Just, just redo that. Isn't that almost an identical thing? It, it is, but that's the distinction but that's I found in the law. I don't see how we would ever say that that would be something we could order. That, that is the distinction found in the law. The, the courts have said, whether it's this court or other courts, that conduct such as, again, a but, handwriting but you, exemplar, but you, voice but exemplar. You, but the handwriting exemplar, um, Yes, it takes some conscious effort to, to know how to write, but I, I guess two things are true. Number one, it's not, uh, the, the, it's not explaining, um, w w giving you the information from my mind about how to descramble. And number two, when you do, the, the, when you do it, you are, um, well, I guess that's, that's it. I mean, it's just, it's just not the same, is it? Well, 
Yes, because you're, you're correct that it doesn't involve uh, giving knowledge from the mind, but neither does this. It does involve use of knowledge, though. We can see that it involves the application of knowledge, but that can be done. Uh, the, the, the Burgess Court, this court in Burgess, specifically addressed that issue of use of the mind and rejected the idea that if a defendant is compelled to use his mind, to use his knowledge, that that offends the privilege. Uh, but those were, those were tax records, um, and the question was if you signed this form, uh, th that you could get them, but you weren't acknowledging anything other than if you have some, y you can, you government can get them. I, I just, I somehow the the act of making this understandable for you seems more than that. Well, I just want to come back to handwriting exemplars. The Do the U.S. Supreme Court in Doe Two said that those involve creating a new piece of evidence that didn't exist before, and yet it can be compelled. Here, what we're asking for is, is something less than that. Um, and there are cases involving people who use their mind to try and disguise handwriting exemplars, which shows that it does involve an application of knowledge of how you normally write and how you're writing now. And the court in Byers, to, to give another example, said that it, a, a defendant can be, or a suspect can be compelled to stop at the scene of an accident that, that he was involved in. That, too, involves the application of knowledge as opposed to imparting knowledge. And it's the application of knowledge even that's uniquely known to the defendant, and yet it can be done. There well, are subtle distinctions in this area of law, but... Well, well let me ask you, if, we, if you prevail here, would encrypted information ever be free from the government's inspection? Well, this is a, a very narrow and unusual uh, an unusual set of circumstances and a narrow question. We're talking about um, the government being unable to decrypt, having knowledge from the defendant himself that he can decrypt, again, that anything he would be implicitly communicating, he's already communicated, and there was a, a protocol in place so that evidence of this procedure is not going to be used against him. He'll do it privately. He's not telling us the password. So really what we're asking for is something very narrow, confined to, to these But you're asking him to provide the information. We're asking him to, to engage in conduct. Right. Uh, Which is to put in the code that will decrypt the files. Correct. And I take it, I, understand, I know this is true, that these computers were seized pursuant to a search warrant based on probable cause to believe that they were used in the course of this criminal scheme. Yes. And that they had evidence of the scheme. Yes, yes. The uh, investigators... Um, saw him using the laptop and had evidence of extensive computer use in the course of this alleged scheme. And yet, now, because he's put up this barrier, we cannot access this evidence that we were lawfully entitled to and, see. And well, why differently than in my example of going into my home and taking all my files that happen to be in code? Because, well... Except that maybe you guys would have the um, capability of decoding it yourself. The problem here is that the government doesn't seem to be able to get to crack the code. True, but, but my, my response to, to your hypothetical, Your Honor, was that we can force somebody to decode, just like if somebody... A case where that, that is, that, it, it, that there's something comparable? There's, there's a set of cases involving... People not like handwriting exemplars? Uh, there's a set of cases involving decryption in particular. Uh, none of them are are binding here, um, and, and they turn on their facts. Um, both cases have, uh, both sides have cited them, but for example, there's a uh, Frick-Kosu case out of the District of, of Colorado. And those, are, those are on a very, I mean, that's really about whether, that's a foregone conclusion case. That's, that's right. right. Yeah, which is but, not what Justice Link's talking about. Oh, really. well, well, we are relying on the foregone conclusion rule, but then, <laughs> getting back to that, um, the, more, uh, the broader principle there, there, there are cases involving uh, somebody who, a defendant who dyed his hair, and now he's told you have to dye your hair back because you can't disguise your appearance. Now that seems more intrusive to most of us. It's a form of conduct, but yet he's basically unencrypting himself. He, he can be told to shave his face. Um, again, undisguising himself. It's a form of conduct that can be compelled. And if, if there's a testimonial component to it, then we, we acknowledge we have to overcome that. But you acknowledge that th th this, this is different than the situation Justice Link has proposed, where you're asking the person to go about reorganizing their files so that you can look at them in a better sense of order. 
this, is, this, this reordering is done by a code, by a machine, mechanically. Uh, and all that you're looking for is that the person enter the key. That's, All right. that's correct. So the files themselves may be quite disorganized within the computer and difficult to sort of figure out which file goes with which file, but that's not what you're asking them to do. You're asking them to sort of put in the code so that they can be decrypted. That's right. It's a very limited form of conduct. It's one that matches what it is he told us he can do. Um, and so but it's more like the, it's the, the combination to the safe, maybe, as opposed to organizing all the materials in the safe? Uh, but the combination of the safe, I take it, the, the United States Supreme Court cites that as an example of what would the Fifth Amendment would prohibit. No, it said telling an inquisitor a combination to the safe as opposed, you, to, yeah. as opposed to giving over the key. So that's the distinction. And, and this court looked at that in Burgess, an, an earlier incarnation of that statement, and said if, the, if Justice Stevens was talking about use, using the mind, that's not prohibited. Uh, and this court was right to say that. Um, but again, but, but so that statement from Hubble that Your Honor refers to just maintains the traditional distinction between imparting the contents of your mind to the government on one hand and producing tangible, uh, tangible evidence or engaging in other forms of conduct on the other hand. So um, are you saying this is like in, in that example, this is like giving the key to the storage room? It, is that it what actually you're is. Because so it's the, not like the combination lock on the, on the safe? It's not like telling an inquisitor a com the combination lock. The, the privilege turns on whether it's a testimonial communication. So if, why, why would it be the case that the distinction would be whether it looks more like a, a jagged piece of metal or more like a set of numbers? The distinction is about whether it involves telling the government something versus doing something. But, 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 but it seems as if all of this is based on a pre-Hubble view of the act of production immunity. I mean, before Hubble, the act of production immunity essentially said, your production is immunized. You may not use the act of production against mm -hmm. you, but you can use the documents if you can authenticate them. And therefore, the foregone conclusion essentially says, there's no taint that is being used because we didn't learn anything from the act of production. We knew all of that. There was a foregone conclusion. There was nothing that we're using that's derived from our act of production immunity. But Hubble says act of production immunity now means that you are immunized not only from the production, but from the documents which you are producing. And that, oh, I don't that's a, and it seems that the foregone conclusion uh, uh, doctrine doesn't survive Hubble because Hubble has changed the manna from heaven doctrine. But Hubble, Counsel, you can respond to Justice you. Gantz and then your time is up. Thank you. Um, Hubble itself made reference to the foregone conclusion rule. And what that case and other cases show is that if it matches, if what the government knows matches what he would be incriminating, excuse me, what he be, would be implicitly communicating, then the rule applies. The government doesn't have to know everything that could be derived from that. And what it also said is that if the foregone conclusion rule applies, then that means that communication is not sufficiently testimonial, so the defendant doesn't get in the door as far as the Fifth Amendment right to begin with. It cuts it off at that point. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Paul Davenport on behalf of Leon Gelfgat. I'm here today with Stanley Hilinski. What the Commonwealth is trying to get Mr. Gelfgat to do is absolutely testimonial and would violate both the Fifth Amendment and Article 12. So what, this is not a key? This is definitely not a key. This is creating new evidence. Right now, the... No, no, wait, 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 wait. This evidence is all on the computer, right? Correct. Okay. In a specific format. All right. That format is of randomized and mixed up ones and zeros. Mm -hmm. And what the government wants Mr. Gelfgat to do mm -hmm. is to put those into the correct order. I take it they were put in the correct order when they were input into the computer. Right. Yes. Okay, but so the they existed they, in that order. But the way they have it right now. He scrambled them. Correct. That, that's the way it was originally at one point. The way that the, gov the government has right now mm -hmm. is of scrambled ones and zeros. Or if you, if, if you want to use an analogy like, like a shredded document, and what they're asking Mr. Gelfgat to do is to rearrange it, is to interpret it, is to create new documents. Now they're asking him to input a key. He's not going to do anything other than input the key. 
Well, I understand that just, the just as they were scrambled, they will be unscrambled, not by, not by him personally going through and sorting them out, but by a machine. By a process that uses by a process. His, by a process that uses his thoughts. And the his process knowledge. uses his thoughts. A cerebral process. This, this prepackaged encryption device uses his thoughts. Absolutely, Your Honor. Um, yes. Basically, it takes his knowledge, his thoughts, his cerebral actions to decode the, the, the current contents of the computer to make it in a formula that's readable now well, to the why government. It, I, I don't know this, but there is some reference in the, in the transcript to maybe it's just the, in, the encryption piece is, <coughs> is on a thumb drive. Is that right? There's been there's nothing in the record to indicate that. There's nothing in the record. He to talks about a thumb drive in, in, in his interview. There's no, questions I don't, put. I, I don't believe that um, he, he did, Your Honor. I, I believe that. There were questions about it, and he says, yeah, yeah. But, but it may be just the encrypt, encryption. Um, I, I believe he was talking about, he, he might have been speaking hypothetically about encryption at that point, but there was no thumb drive re recovered. There's been no demand for a thumb drive. There's been no search for a thumb drive. Uh, not, not in my humble knowledge or opinion, Your but, Honor. But following up on that, if, if there were, let's just say, this uh, de-encryption formula um, written down somewhere or transcribed in some format, um, would it be a different story if the government just said you must produce that? I, I think that that would be a completely different case. In that particular instance, um, the government might be within their rights to demand um, Paper that already exists. Um, paper that already exists on which paper or if it were a thumb drive or whatever, whatever format it happened to be in. Uh, that, that, you know, I mean, many people have to write down someplace uh, their uh, pin codes and so on and so forth in order to be able to keep them straight. Um, is there a difference between saying, you know, you have to go and undo it yourself, you know, insert your own pin code, as it were, versus turn over what you've written down your pin code is? Absolutely, night and day, Your Honor. Um, what they're trying to do is they're trying to extract knowledge and information from Mr. Gelfgat's head that isn't written down somewhere, that isn't in physical form. They're, they're trying to go beyond a mere mechanical handwriting exemplar or voice exemplar. They're trying to go into his mind and, and force the contents so they can use it against him. And that's what offends liberty. And that's what offends the Fifth Amendment in Article 12. So what, what testimony is being sought here? What, what makes this testimonial? There's a variety they're, they're, of... They're basically saying, go into that room, decrypt it. Don't tell us, you don't need to tell us how you do it, just decrypt it. It's analogous to open the safe for us. We don't need the combination, just open the safe for us. And, and we don't, and certainly your act of decrypting doesn't tell us anything about whether these files are yours, what they mean, nothing. I think they do. Uh, I think that the, the, the proposed prophylactic measures they're mentioning are intellectually dishonest. Um, they, they've left themselves a considerable stop. Okay, well, let's, let's, just, let's just say they left no nothing. Let's just hypothetically, they just said, go in that room and decrypt. And that's the end of it. We're not reserving any rights to use it for consciousness of guilt. We're not, we're not doing anything. We just want you to decrypt. Period. But it, it gives the Commonwealth more evidence than they already have. They have bits and pieces from other sources. This is the origin. Yeah, and, I, I and know, so but, but that would be the same thing with a, with a buccal swab. It gives them more evidence than they already have, doesn't it? But it comes from his mind. It comes from internally. And in the process, the, what makes it testimonial to link the two questions together is that it's showing ownership, it's showing control, it's authenticating the information, it's establishing a chain of custody. All of these things are potentially going to be used against him at trial despite their protests to the contrary. I think, of course, they are. Well, Tell but, me, did, did he create the code or did he just to get a software program with the code. I don't think that's clear from the record. I, I know that they were speaking hypothetically about encryption during the course of the interrogation. He never specifically said, this is the encryption software that I'm using, or where it came from. He did mention traveling abroad, um, and once again, he was speaking hypothetically about encryptions, but he never said, I use whatever. I, I know they're alleging it's TrueCrypt. He never said, I'm using TrueCrypt. The, it's not clear from the record exactly what he, he's using and what the process is to decrypt. Well, let me ask you, hypothetically, if someone just bought some software program that did the, uh, the scrambling and they just typed in their information and the software program uh, did the scrambling and the government asked for 
uh, that person to unscramble. So they didn't use, their, they didn't make this code up, they just bought it. Would you take the same position? I think it's the same either way. Basically what you're doing is you're telling him that he must change the evidence that they have and make it readable to them using his mind in the same way as if you were translating a code or a series of symbols. Basically by forcing him to change what they have into a readable format, <clears throat> that's what's using the knowledge from in his mind against him. Even well, this if it was is a, a software program that did it? Even if it's a software program that, that did it because once again, it, it, I think it's a mistake to assume that it's the program doing all of the work. It, it's, well, it's it, it, we've got a, an amicus brief that came in uh, the other day, and it says, and maybe this is not right, is crucial to understand the technology. The decryption key is generated randomly by the software and is not a product of the defendant's mind at all. I can't disagree with that amicus brief more highly. In my understanding of encryption software, you choose the, the keys, and that's the, the term they use, to encrypt and decrypt. Sometimes they're different. And the key is very often not just a word or not just numbers and letters. Very often it's phrases, it's sentences. But, but here you say that the, the numbers were ones and, and, and zeros. That's the data, not that's the, the encryption key. The data on any computer, all that the computer can understand is ones and zeros, binary language. A computer can't understand anything more than that. But those ones and zeros mean something. And so you compile them through one or more levels of compilation, and they come to a form that we recognize when it's displayed on a monitor, English language, right. or some other language. Uh, why is this case different from the case in which your client is subpoenaed to deliver all, all computer records? Uh, there's no active production immunity that, to my knowledge, under Massachusetts law, there's only transactional immunity. Uh, is this, is this essential? I mean, is the government essentially trying to carve out some kind of active production immunity in the absence of a statutory provision? I, I, I think that what they're trying to do is they're trying to propose prophylactic measures which sort of mask uh, or mimic a, productive, a production immunity. But you're right. They, they cannot get this from Mr. Gelfgat without offering him transactional immunity. And this is post-indictment. He has been indicted. He's charged with a crime. They can't extract this information from his head without giving him transactional immunity. I couldn't agree with you more. But what does that mean? I mean... I assume in 10, 15 years, almost everything's going to be encrypted. I mean, what, what's, is, I, there, is there a problem to be imposing a constitutional restraint which could essentially cripple law enforcement in any white-collar case? I don't agree that it cripples law enforcement. Law enforcement is free to use the same technology that everybody else is using and to get better at decrypting encrypted um, uh, data. Th they have the same tools. They have access to the same computers and the same software. It's not Mr. Gelfgat's fault or problem that they simply can't do their job, that they can't decrypt what they have seized. It's not on him to do their job for him. If they've collected all the pieces of a puzzle, it's not up to him to put the puzzle together so that it makes a picture. That's their job. And it's, it's, it's tyranny to force an individual to do that for the government. They have their job. He has a right against self-incrimination. It offends every tenant of civil liberties under the Fifth Amendment in Article 12. The turning over the key does not, however. Turning over a physical key does not extract information from the mind, and I would agree with you. This is the key. I would agree that it's only uh, called a key, and it's, a, it's sort of a coincidence that they've used the same term, but it's not a key. It's not a physical key. It's information locked away in Mr. Gelfgat's brain, and the only way that they can do it, other than doing their actual job, would be to force it from his mind. Yeah, we don't read books anymore either. We read data, sort of electronic signals. Uh, but does that change what they are? It, it, it doesn't change what they are unless and until you're forcing somebody to divulge the contents of their mind to assist in your own prosecution, to, to help the government potentially put you in prison. But we force people to help the government all the time with uh, handwriting, fingerprints, swabs, a whole range of things, lineups, change color of hair. That's very different because it's only mechanical. You're only requiring mechanical. You're not requiring a cerebral process. You're not requiring the extraction of thought. You're not requiring Mr. Gelfgat to take his knowledge and employ it against himself, becoming an agent of the Commonwealth. All you're doing is requiring mechanical handwriting, which anybody could do half unconscious. All you're requiring is somebody turn to over do the Turn over the electronic key. Turn over the electronic key. 
It, well, I got it. That means I got to remember what it is, which is an exercise of my mind. Is that what you're talking about here? Not only is it an exercise of your mind in remembering it, but it was an exercise of your mind in creating that. And you're basically, it's but being used. But if you created it voluntarily, it's, I mean, the, the, the act of creation isn't protected. But it's not in physical form. It's in his head. And if, if he had written it down, then I, I would agree with you. Then it, it's, it's physical papers. It could be seized. Um, but if it's, if it's his knowledge, if it's in his head, it's unfair to force him to divulge it when it's clearly going to be used against him. That, that's exactly why we have the Fifth Amendment in Article 12. So I mean, I'm, you've now confused me because I would, I would think that if the Commonwealth were now to subpoena, a, if you phys had a physical key and the Commonwealth were to subpoena a physical key from you, you would claim the Fifth Amendment saying that by giving the key, you would show that you have custody and control over that which the key unlocks. That would be a production issue. If there were, if, if, you know, in the case law, it does talk about production issues, but I'm, I, when I was using the term key, meaning uh, an encryption key in your head, not a physical key, and I know it's confusing because they're both called keys. Right, but the problem is that we have the Hubble case where they say a key is okay. Uh, but the Hubble case also says if you make extensive use of the contents of your own mind, to identify and assemble the 100 pages of documents, that's when it becomes a problem. But the, you, so is it, is it a continuum? I'm, I mean, I'm sorry. In other words, Hubble, in, in Hubble, as you just said, the issue was he was going to have to do a whole lot of work in uh, arranging these documents, right? I, I agree. I don't think it's the, 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 the amount of work is the factor. I think it's the fact that he's using his own cerebral processes. But you just quoted the word extensive. Extensive use of his own mind, right? Extensive in the terms of its cerebral. It's not just rote mechanical handwriting or rote voice exemplar. It's but some of the language, I mean, it's, it's quoted in Burgess, I think, about an insubstantial amount of increment, right? I mean, I, Well, Burgess it, is different because it's, it's simply tax records. It's not coming from anybody's mind. Um, it's, it's tax records held by a third party, and they're simply being forced to sign a form authorizing the release. If, if, if this was information that was in somebody's head, their thoughts, their knowledge, I think it would be a completely different outcome. Does this case turn on, what the, on, our, on our understanding of what the nature of the technology is? I don't think it does. Um, I, if, if, well, I think in trying it, to find the right analog, is it a key, is it... Is it a code? Is it? Is I, it? I think if you go back hundreds of years to encrypted messages where people used codes and ciphers, it's the same thing, and this is not involving a computer. You can't take somebody and force that information out of their head to help the government understand it, to decrypt it, to to translate it, um, to fill in what the symbols mean, because that's using their thoughts, their knowledge. If it's already written down, then. It's, it's physical. It's not coming from their head. It's not thought. It's not a cerebral process. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that technology really changes the, the equation at all. Judge Brassard, even, that was the foundation of his decision. He said, this sounds too much like if, some, if a piece of paper was recovered and it was 50 years old and, and it was it's some sort of code, the government cannot force that individual to translate it, to decode it. And I think he was right. It's nothing to do with the technology. That's pen and paper. I see my time is just about up. If there are no other questions, um, I rely on my brief and I ask you to answer in the negative. Thank you very much, counsel. Thank you, everybody.